I'm going to present my research on LCA for integration of environmental and social concerns into technology development. Uh, we're going to look at a case study of single wall carbon nanotubes for lithium ion batteries. Uh, we're going to start off with something pretty familiar to most, if not all of you guys, which is the generic life cycle assessment uh, boundaries or diagram. And it's increasingly realized that this is the correct framework for making environmental decisions and environmental assessment te of technologies because the broad boundaries prevent shifting of burden from one life cycle phase to another. So you have to consider environmental impacts from all activities related to a product or technology development from you know, mining and extraction of materials to benefaction, manufacturing, use, and then ultimately end of life. Um, and these broad boundaries, uh, like I said, prevent shifting of burden. For example, you could imagine maybe you have a battery that is lightweight and stores the same amount of energy and you use it in your hybrid or electric vehicle and it saves you maybe 10 megajoules throughout the entire lifetime of the driving the vehicle. Now, you have to balance that against investments made early on in manufacturing. Say if you spend 100 megajoules to manufacture that battery, then you actually haven't saved any energy. And that's why these boundaries are increasingly realized uh, to be the proper, proper framework for environmental assessment. And so a number of regulatory agencies and experts have identified this and call for application of life cycle assessment to nanotechnology. So here's the US EPA and their draft nanomaterial research strategy has a chapter on life cycle perspectives. Similarly, and more recently, the National Nanotechnology Initiative has called out the role for life cycle assessment to mitigate potential adverse human and environmental impacts of nanotechnology. And also the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars says LCA is the right framework to understand systemic environmental impacts of these technologies. Now these calls are largely based on uh, recognition that the linear model of innovation that is you know, federal funding goes in to basic research and then you only do you know, broader assessment, environmental assessment, social assessment at the end. Um, and, and you have to wait until the technologies are developed and deployed on large scales before you can actually assess the impacts. Now, these calls for LCA of nanotechnology are based on kind of the failure of this model and a large critique of linear innovation. Another quote says, you know, failure to anticipate and analyze new technologies that are being created and commercialized at an ever-increasing rate. So there's this push to incorporate environmental concerns and social concerns into <coughs> technology development. That is, instead of waiting till the end when the technology is already deployed and it's too late, incorporate these concerns early on in the phases of basic research, applied research, development, and through incorporation of these into <coughs> technology development, the resulting technologies will have more potential for environmental and social benefit. Unfortunately, LCA as it exists now is unable to promote this kind of social and environmental integration. It relies heavily on data about inputs and emissions for each of these life cycle stages, data that's generally available only after the technology has been produced at a large scale, um, and it's, you know, it doesn't have the foresight necessary to, uh, to guide the emerging technologies like nanotechnology towards environmental improvement. The analogy we use in our group a lot is it's as though you're, you're driving your car and you're trying to steer it looking forward, but in fact LCA can only give you the rear view mirror and show you what you've already done and mistakes that have been made in the past. We're going to cover some specific challenges of life cycle assessment for nanomaterials, particularly material variability and toxicity and risk uncertainty, and then we'll focus more on the performance and use phase towards the end of the presentation. So specifically, uh, LCA of nanomaterials struggles because there's a lot of variability even within a narrow type or class of nanomaterials. So here's single wall carbon nanotubes of different chiralities and different NM indices is how they describe the structure of a carbon nanotube. And this shows that your optical properties where you absorb light 
changes you know, pretty significantly across the visible spectrum just based on you know, the addition of one more carbon atom or changing the chiral angle slightly. And this will change the properties of the, of the carbon nanotubes from metallic or semiconducting uh, to semi-metals. And this is, this is a big challenge for LCA because you need to address the ultimate performance of these materials. Um, variability is also a big problem in the upstream processing and identifying uh, energy burdens of these manufacturing processes. So this is a figure of how the uh, cumulative energy requirements of manufacturing various carbon nanomaterials can vary by you know, three orders of magnitude. Another problem is uncertainty in the toxicology and risk and fate of these materials in the environment. And this is really driven by uh, lack of certainty about basic material properties. So here's a paper that used some existing fate and transport models and applied them to carbon nanomaterials, <coughs> carbon nanotubes specifically, in a bounding type approach because the uncertainty spans more than 20 orders of magnitude. <laughs> In these, in these studies. And so, you know, the, the resulting, uh, the results of that study, you know, likewise they have this kind of realistic worst case scenario, and those vary by, you know, this is a log scale on the bottom, again, orders of magnitude <coughs> uncertainty. So if you do a review of published life cycle assessments of uh, nanomaterials in general, you see that research is generally fragmented. And that is, there are some people who talk about <coughs> use of critical or scarce materials, a lot of research on risk and fate and transport properties of these materials, some people, although less, doing energy intensity of manufacturing, great work on, on social impacts across the life cycle of nanomaterials. But it's fragmented. None of these have been integrated into a comprehensive whole. Also, I like this figure because it calls attention to the fact that research from many disciplines is needed to inform LCA of nanotechnology. You can't just leave it to, you know, fate and toxicology researchers, you can't leave it to process engineers, you can't leave it to social scientists, you need to integrate all of this knowledge to inform LCA. So, we're presenting a new model of life cycle assessment, what we call anticipatory life cycle assessment that emphasizes a different framework and a different kind of feedback. So you'll remember here's you know, where we would start with our upstream manufacturing use, end of life. But instead of using that as the boundary, we're looking at you know, the broader system in which uh, researchers inform the development of these technologies. And this framework emphasizes knowledge feedback as opposed to material feedback. Um, so what you'll see, you know, you, you collect inventory, you can do scenario development, thermodynamic modeling to come up with inventory where data is scarce. You can explore the sensitivity of this to different functional units and how that may incorporate some impacts more than others. Uh, less work, or I've done less work on, on the characterization factors and the toxicology side, but Similarly, you can explore you know, the, the sensitivity of these to various characterization factors and knowledge feedback back to these uh, various researchers, whether they're toxicologists or uh, process flow engineers. And through, through this kind of integrative and knowledge feedback framework, we think LCA can actually guide the development of these technologies <coughs> towards environmentally and socially preferable outcomes. Now, part of this is recognizing that social values are implicit in life cycle assessment. And we think there are a lot of you know, ports of entry through which uh, social decisions are made, although not made explicitly. So, for example, the functional unit reflects you know, social value of some service provided to society, and choosing that will you know, determine which so services get accounted for in the LCA and which don't. Similarly, system boundaries will reflect you know, which processes you're valuing in the LCA, whether you want to focus on manufacturing or recycling, and uh, those that are not. And finally, impact category selection is going to reflect you know, social valuation of some impacts over others. So a lot of LCAs seem to report in greenhouse gas equivalents or focus on global warming potential. 
and uh, and that reflects you know a larger concern for global warming over other impacts. So we're trying to incorporate some methods of real-time technology assessment to broaden and make explicit these social values in LCA. So the, the methods that I'm going to call particular attention to are foresight, which is we have to build some capacity to uh, understand where technologies may go or at least explore where they may go. And we think we can include this in anticipatory LCA through scenario development, thermodynamic modeling, and looking at analogous experience curves. Engagement, LCA practitioners have to understand how the decisions they make reflect some people's values <coughs> more than others and then maybe engage with a broader uh, segment of society to see how those decisions could be changed and ultimately how that changes LCA results. And integration is the theme of this all, so you uh, come up with your LCA results and you communicate it back to technology developers, toxicologists, uh, and ultimately integrate these broader concerns into the technology development process. So here's one example of how decisions a person would make in the LCA kind of bound your, uh, your social considerations. So, uh, for example, if you're looking at lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, you know, you, you really are intervening just in this small part of a much larger social system. And by choosing, you know, for example, a functional unit of megawatt hour storage capacity or kilowatt hour storage capacity, you kind of miss this larger context, um, which is equally valid and would shape LCA results. So these are other uh, stakeholders whom we should engage with in doing an LCA and incorporate their feedback into decisions like the functional unit, the system boundary, and seeing how that changes your LCA results. So we're going to walk through a quick case study example of carbon nanotubes for lithium ion batteries, <coughs> how, how this anticipatory model can incorporate both social and environmental concerns into technology development. So lithium ion batteries are taking increasing shares of the market. This data is a little old, but I think it just continues to grow, um, particularly for hybrid and electric vehicles. Now, sorry, you'll note up in the top, we kind of have a, a map relating back to that anticipatory LCA model, which is you are here. So right now we're talking about the functional unit. The reason lithium ion batteries are increasingly relied on is because they have higher energy density than other battery chemistries. So here you see the EV1 relied on something like 2,000 pounds of lead acid batteries, which gave it an ultimate range of 40 miles or something. And as technology has progressed, we've kind of moved towards these higher energy densities. Here's the Prius, which has nickel metal hydride, the Tesla, lithium ion cylindrical, Nissan Leaf, lithium polymer, and, and as just a quick point of comparison, gasoline would be kind of up in the top corner of this room here. So batteries have a long way to go to compete with conventional fuels. This has led a number of researchers to suggest using single wall carbon <coughs> nanotube anodes in lithium ion batteries. This could increase your energy density anywhere from you know 400 to off the chart here, 1100 milliamp hours of storage capacity. Now this is a large improvement over existing technologies. But you say, aha, we remember, you have to evaluate this from broader life cycle boundaries so that you're uh, evaluating the benefits in the use phase against investments you've made earlier on in manufacturing. So this is the, this is the boundary of my analysis. We're going to compare you know, the energy and feedstock requirements for a single wall carbon nanotube through the HIPCO process and then explore their use in anodes of lithium ion batteries. And we're going to do this through thermodynamic modeling of this process. And it's a second law exergy model, so it accounts for upstream impacts. And then we're going to apply use phase bounding. That is, we don't really know how well that lithium ion anode will perform, but we can say, you know, worst case scenario, sorry, we're going back to that figure. We're going to say, worst case scenario, it performs down here. Best case scenario, you're all the way up there. We know from previous studies that single wall carbon nanotube manufacturing is extremely energy intensive. 
Uh, it requires a lot of electricity by you know any method, although HIPCO we chose because it's comparatively the best. Um, the problem with this figure, and, and you know you're comparing to other benchmark materials industries, um, to uh, to kind of give you some understanding that those are much larger than even you know single crystalline silicon. Now the problem with this figure is that it portrays this as static. You know, it portrays these as fixed numbers. While we know that material industries improve with increases in scale, increases with uh, efficiency, more learning of the process. And so here are uh, single crystalline and monocrystalline silicon over the past 15 years, and they've shown pretty large decreases in the energy invested in manufacturing. This is per meter squared of solar panel. Similarly, there's more data for pig iron production and aluminum production by the hall harrow process, and they show a similar decrease over the last you know, 100, 200 years um, from higher values crashing towards their thermodynamic minimum. And so the question is, to what extent will single wall carbon nanotubes follow this same pattern? Um, here's early data for the HIPCO process uh, showing, you know, almost an order of two orders of magnitude decrease, and how much can we expect this to go into the future, especially given that their thermodynamic minimum is way down here. So building off of this analogy of those experience curves, we developed you know, two scenarios of improvement for single wall carbon nanotube manufacturing and use in uh, lithium ion anodes. This is kind of a funky unit, so this is how much energy it takes to make a kilowatt hour storage capacity in your battery. So it's energy invested per storage capacity in your battery. And what you see, uh, even though this is a very simplistic plot, uh, you see there are two regions here. This upper region explores the use phase potential, that is if we are going from you know, the very bottom of that oval on the Tesla figure to the top of it, uh, and this explores the manufacturing potential for improvement. That is, if we stay exactly where we are now in terms of manufacturing efficiency, or if we go towards a thermodynamic minimum. And the main, uh, just for comparison, the break-even point is where lithium-ion battery manufacturing is right now for commercial, commercially available lithium-ion batteries. So what you see here is that the use phase is actually a very small part of the environmental potential and that manufacturing dominates. That is a research agenda focused on improving the use phase of carbon nanomaterials and lithium ion batteries has little potential for environmental improvement. Instead, research should focus on manufacturing. Going back to the larger picture, this we think is unable to, you know, this existing LCA frameworks as codified in ISO are unable to kind of handle the uncertainty and uh, research agendas, excuse me, uh, unable to be applicable to carbon nanomaterials, and we need a different framework that highlights knowledge feedback to various actors in nanotechnology development. So this case example specifically went through inventory, kind of explored functional unit and how you can overcome uncertainty there and also relates back to process flow engineers and carbon nanotube technology developers saying that you know, for, for real environmental improvement through these technologies, focus on manufacturing instead of improving the performance of your anode. With that, I'd like to thank my faculty and fellow students of the Seeds uh, Studio, my funders most specifically, the Quest Research Center and the Center for Nanotechnology and Society, and I'll answer any questions.